to start off, let me just say, this is the greatest story no one's ever heard before. And the best way to think of it as, is as a cosmic detective story. So we're going to start our detective story with someone that I'm sure everyone in Britain has heard of, William Shakespeare. And uh, William Shakespeare's story more or less begins when he was 13 years old and he went to the feet at Leicester and saw all these actors in wonderful costumes and pageants and got inspired. So we're going to jump over from 1577 to 1585 when a very young Shakespeare left his wife and young twins behind in Avon and went adventuring. And the supposition is that he went to London and became an actor and so forth and eventually rose up through the ranks to become a famous playwright. But that supposition leaves the lost year sort of hanging and it doesn't explain how Shakespeare, supposedly semi-educated peasant boy, uh, was able to have all this wonderful occult knowledge, this wonderful knowledge of the world in his plays. And that gap of experience, that gap of time, if you will, is where everyone tends to go, oh, well, Shakespeare really wasn't Shakespeare. He was Bacon, he was De Vere, he was Marlowe. No, William Shakespeare was William Shakespeare. He just had a very interesting few years as a secret agent. Okay? And in those wonderful few years as a secret agent, he made friends with the most brilliant mind of the era, Dr. John Dee. And we can trace most of the stuff that is in Shakespeare that has no direct explanation to his years with Dee. Dee had the largest library in England, one of the largest libraries in Europe. And if there was any one place you could go to to get everything from ceremonial magic of Agrippa to Hollinshed's Chronicles to the history of the Irish race, it was Dee's library in Mortlake. So a very young Shakespeare left Avon, and he came to London, and because of his connections with the Earls of Leicester, the Stanleys and the Herberts, and that large crowd, he became friends with Sir Philip Sidney's circle, the Areopagus circle, and a minor poet member of that circle by the name of Edward Dyer needed a bright young man who had a good legible hand and could write quickly to be his secretary. So Dyer hired Shakespeare to be his secretary. Now Dyer, in addition to being a minor poet at this point, was also a spy. And his spy master was this fellow here, Burley, William Cecil. So Burley sent Dyer and Shakespeare to the continent to follow D and Kelly. Now, we have to jump back slightly and explain about D and Kelly. Uh, John D was the most brilliant mind of his era. He's the man that pulled mathematics out of the realm of magic and turned it into a science. He wrote the prologue to Euclid's theorems. He created the system that we still use today for celestial navigation, which allowed the English mariners to conquer the new world, find the new world, and then conquer it. And by the 1580s, early 1580s, John Dee had mastered all of human knowledge as it existed then. And still wanting more knowledge, Dee decided that the only way to get more information was to bump it up a notch and talk to the angels. Now in the 1560s, Dee had come across several works, one of whom was by the abbot of Spontheim, Trithemius, which codes and green language hid the core of how you do angelic communications. So Dee decided in the early 1580s that he would give it a shot, that he would talk to the angels. And pretty much as soon as he made this decision, an angel came rapping at his prayer room window, which was on the, what we would call in America, the third floor, you'd call it the second floor, of his house at Mortlake. And lo and behold, when he went and pulled the curtains back and opened the window, 
There was an angel floating in the air, and the angel handed him a shoe stone, a small round globe of rutilated smoky quartz. Now, this shoe stone still exists. If you're lucky, you can go see it in the British Museum, and if you sweet talk the little lady who's in charge of the manuscript room, she may even open the case and let you touch it. Now, that's what happened to me, and I was standing there holding the stone, and she's going, oh, please don't drop it. And I was fighting the new age desire to rub it on my third eye, put it on top of my head, but all I got to do was just hold it. And just simply holding the shoe stone that the angel gave Dee in 1581 triggered a whole sequence of events over the next year and a half that led to a group of us standing on a mountain in Sedona and chanting the entire Enochian corpus uh, and watching uh, the Ophanim, or the Whirling Ones, come down as big eye-filled eye tornadoes. It's a slightly different story. What Dee would, did with the shoe stone is immediately try any member of his family, anyone standing around, to see if they could see anything in it. And he didn't have very good result with that. His footman, his servant, uh, saw shadows and became frightened. Uh, he even tried children. They saw a little bit more, but nothing of, of, of interest. Until finally, one fine spring morning in 1582, a very charming con man who introduced himself as Edward Talbot at that point, showed up. And after just a few minutes of discussion, Dee ushered him into the prayer room. And Kelly immediately began to see images in the stone. And they were off and running for eight years continuous of angelic conversations. Now, the entertaining point about those early sessions is that the angels began to deliver a language. But first of all, they had to deliver a filter. And that filter was called the seal of truth. EH20. And the seal of truth is a very interesting diagram. Dan can explain at length why the 5 7 represents symmetry angles and all sorts of truly remarkable ideas and concepts. The angels delivered this so that the transmission would be pure. And they said that not only do you need to have the shoe stone on top of the seal of truth, but you need to have a very special arrangement on the table under the seal of truth. And even the legs of the table need to be sitting on small versions of the seal of truth so that nothing can come through that doesn't pass through this very precise filter. So as soon as they had the seal of truth up and running, the angels delivered, can we have the 64 lang language grid? Yeah, no, the, the next one, yeah. And D records that he had a piece of parchment in front of him. And on that piece of parchment, very slowly, like developing a photograph, appeared this grid of letters. Now, this is not the entire Enochian alphabet. This is the title of the Enochian letters. Now, in English, we have A, and we spell A, ah, sometimes. But the name and the letter are directly related. In Enochian, the name or the title of the letter is not simple. It's complex. In fact, some of the Enochian letters have four and five, uh, can we skip on just one? Have four or five different, there we go. Have four or five different letters attributed to each letter. But it completely fills in the eight by eight grid. And eight by eight is 64. The number of transfer proteins in RNA and the number of co codons in DNA. Now this, language grid was given on Good Friday, 1582, and the angels told Edward Kelly that he needed to learn this so he could read the script the next time they got together. Now, Kelly, in the beginning, was probably conning Dee, and he really probably didn't believe it, 
probably thought this was just a good way to get into this guy's good graces so he could sell him some spurious gold powder and some spurious manuscripts. But Kelly got tricked. And on Easter Monday, 1582, when the angels came back and said, can you read it yet? And Kelly said, no, I didn't learn it. The angels squeezed him. And Dee records that Kelly was in excruciating pain for about 20 minutes. And when he came out of his pain trance, he could read it. Now, this gives us the clue that the language itself is being extruded, is being produced by the DNA. So once Kelly could read the language, then the angels began transmitting, first of all, uh, a series of sort of practice runs that sort of like uh, what we call in the South speaking in tongues. It's sort of nonsense syllables. But as those nonsense syllables built up, it eventually became a language. Now we know of over 7,000 languages of which only a handful are man-made. And those man-made languages are usually experiments or their technical languages. But in all the 7,000 languages and all the dozen or so made-up languages, there's not one that is real that has a grammar and a syntax that can be translated. They're all artificial. Enochian is a real language. And the curious thing is the calls or the invocations in this language were given early on and years passed before the angels got around to translating them. But when the angels did translate them, it turns out that they, it was a very coherent language. It was a language that you can, in fact, use to create other statements. You, once you understand the grammar, you can actually make up your own calls, make up your invocations. It's a real language. So when, when the angel squeezed Kelly and extruded this awareness of language out of his DNA, it started a process. Now, about a year after the squeezing experience, uh, a fellow by the name of Count Albert Lasky arrived from Poland, and he explained to Dee and Kelly that if you're using the seal of Ahmet, well, I happen to know a place where there's a real seal of Ahmet on the land. And that place was Prague. Now, Prague is surrounded by seven hills. And in the very center of town, there is a pentagram formed of five synagogues. So the very city of Prague is an analog of the seal of truth. Now, this really got Dee's juices going, in addition to Prague was also the capital of Rudolf II, who was very much the hermetic philosopher king of the time. And so this seemed to be the answer to a lot of situations, both spiritual and political, in the sense that if you were going to start a new hermetic world, Prague is probably the place in the late 16th century that you'd want to start it. Basically, Dee and Kelly launched on what we'll call an apocalyptic missionary journey. And their apocalyptic missionary work was to convince as many rulers as possible that Christianity was completely defunct and that it was time for a new hermetic, based on the work of Hermes, worldview. Since Rudolf was already uh, very susceptible to this idea, this was very much what Rudolf believed, they expected they would get a, a very powerful reception in Prague, and they did. Now, one of the things that Kelly brought along with him when he showed up at Dee's door was a vial of what he thought was the powder of projection, the philosopher's stone material that would turn base metal into gold, and a very ancient manuscript in a language no one could read because it was in code that we now know of as the Voynich Manuscript. Now, Dee, of course, was fascinated with both, and they decided that this was the best way to get close to the emperor is to offer him these presents. And, of course, 
Rudolph, loving anything that was occult and mysterious and strange, just thought this was wonderful. So that's how the Voynich manuscript ended up with Rudolph II. Now, we have, I should perhaps talk a little bit about Dee's diaries. Dee was Queen Elizabeth's chief intelligencer. He wasn't like Burley, the person who ran spies. He was the person who took the information from all the spies and made sense of it. He was sort of the um, head analyst, if you want to think of it that way. So Dee kept a private diary, quote, quote, private diary, that was meant to be left laying around so that all the spies could read it and get the wrong impression about who was visiting and where they were going and what they were working on. And he kept a private, really private, working diary of all the magic stuff that was hidden for 60 or 70 years after his death, which would indicate that Dee didn't intend anyone to see that diary. So it's often a bit of a balancing act to try to figure out from the public private diary what's true and valid and what was a hoax, and comparing it to the truly private diary in which Dee kept meticulous records of everything they did. Now, in looking through the private, li the private diary, we discover a series of names, and those names are all around the idea of the Brothers Garland, or Brothers of the Garland. And there are four names that have Garland attached. And in searching through the entire record of the Elizabethan era, there is not a single record of any of these Garlands buying anything, selling anything, being paid anything, having any uh, connection to the crown. It's as if they don't exist outside of Dee's diaries. And some associated material that we find in the archives of Denmark related to Taco Brahe. But those names are coherent. They're the same group of names. And one of those names is Edward Garland, which John Dee quickly stops calling him Edward Garland and gives him his real name, Edward Dyer. And Edward Garland, Edward Dyer's friend, brother, etc., was Francis Garland. And again, there is absolutely no record outside of Dee's diary and a few associated documents in Denmark of anyone named Francis Garland. We can trace a John Garland who was somewhat well known, entirely different person. But Francis Garland apparently does not exist outside of Dee's realm of influence. Now this started a train of thought, who are these mysterious Garlands? Since obviously they were code names because Edward Garland very quickly became Edward Dyer and Francis Garland was his secretary, then we started looking for who might really be, what would the real name of this Francis Garland be? Well, very early on, we stumbled onto a unattributed portrait of a 24-year-old in 1588, same age as Shakespeare would have been, that looked like a very young and skinny Shakespeare. I don't have a, a picture of this because I haven't got permission yet to use it from its owners. But in that particular period, to um, show your spy master who the real spies were and who was working for whom, portraits would be painted very similar to the marriage portraits that would be very realistic, quickly done so you could make many copies but it would really show what the person looked like. So we speculated that this unattributed but very similar to a young Shakespeare with the right age uh, was Francis Garland. So as we began to look for Francis Garland and didn't find him, we began to cross-reference Shakespeare. And guess what? Every time we have Francis Garland showing up with D, there's no record of Shakespeare. In the entire 10 years that Francis Garland appears in Dee's diary, there is not a single incident of Shakespeare being you know, knowledgeably attributed to be in one place when Garland is in another. And so the idea began to grow that maybe Francis Garland was Shakespeare. 
Now, this is fascinating. If Shakespeare actually, as a young man, traveled as a spy for the queen, one of Burley's intelligencers, and spent time with D, spent time in Prague at the court of Rudolph II, then all the mysteries of Shakespeare's work vanish like players at the end of a play. It goes away. He, of course, would have learned all of his occultism and all of his higher science, higher awarenesses from D. He would have learned all about court etiquette and politics and intrigue from the court of Rudolph II. He would even have made the connection with Elsinore and, and Hamlet from the political point of view, from the connection with Tycho Brahe. So all of the problems with where did Shakespeare get his information just vanish. And the kicker is that one of Shakespeare's most, how should we say, dense plays, King Lear, has its origin in the megalithic history of Prague. The tradition is, is that the Celtic king of Prague, one King Croc, had three daughters who were all witches. And King Croc wanted to retire and work on his druidic studies, so he passed the kingdom over to his daughters. And the eldest two daughters made bad, made bad marriages and had quite a bit of problems. You can just read it in King Lear. And the third one, who became Cordelia, was a princess named Libusa. And Libusa had an experience at uh, the ancient megalithic site in Prague in which she saw a vision of a great golden city arising within the seven hills of Prague. And Libusa is considered to be the founder of Prague because of her vision of the golden city. If you overlay King Lear and you overlay the, le the legends of King Croc and his daughters, the parallels are immediate, obvious, and stunning. So not only do we have a Francis Garland that we can't contradict by saying, oh, he wasn't Shakespeare because Shakespeare was here and we say Garland's here. There is no contradiction there. Shakespeare and Garland always are in different places. If we have dates for Shakespeare, we have corresponding dates for Garland that do not overlap. We know, for instance, that Shakespeare registered his first work in 1593, two weeks before he registered Venus and Adonis, which is a masterful tantric alchemical poem. He was visiting, Francis Garland was visiting John Dee at Mortlake. And this happened several times in the early 1590s. It's as if Garland was taking his works to D to get approval before he had them published under his real name. We actually have a poem written by Edward Kelly, and you'll notice that it's dedicated to his good friend, G.S. Now, on Shakespeare's birth record in Avon, he's not William Shakespeare, he's Guilleme Shakespeare. So anywhere on the continent, anywhere outside of England, William was Guilleme. And we even have some contemporary references to Shakespeare as G.S. or Guilleme Shakespeare from, the six, from 1600, 1601, from an Italian fellow who actually saw some of the plays. So if you were going to refer to good old Will outside of England, he would have been Guilleme or G.S. Now if you study this poem, this poem is a how-to document on how to do alchemical theater. Just what Shakespeare produced um, subsequent to this instruction by Kelly. So we have this sort of level of, of documentation that Guilleme Shakespeare was the especial good friend of Edward Kelly. Now, Kelly and Dyer uh, Dyer and Shakespeare traveled to check on Dee and Kelly, and the very first thing Kelly did as soon as they arrived, knowing they were spies and knowing who they were spying for, is that Kelly took them down to the basement of the castle and produced a real, authentic alchemical transmutation right in front of them. December 19th, 1586. And Kelly, being the clever person that he was, he gave the crucible to Dyer to take back to Burley. And if you 
know anything about alchemy and faking alchemy, the crucible is key. Because if you just simply have some gold in the bottom of your crucible covered by a, a false bottom, that's going to show up when you examine the crucible. So the crucible proved that Kelly had really performed a transmutation. Dyer took this back to England. Burley and the Queen were so excited that they immediately sent Dyer back to become Kelly's student and or to spy on him and see if he could steal the secret. So all these links bring us around to the situation right about the same time as the Spanish Armada in which there's a group of people in Prague around Dee and Kelly and they're all spying for the Queen, they're all spying for Philip II, they're all spying for Rudolph, they're all spying for the Catholic Church. In those days, it wasn't enough to be a spy for one power. To really make it work, you had to be a spy for everybody. And um, so you have this, this teeming circle of espionage swirling around the fact that the Protestant world was about to end. And if you know your, your history, uh, the Spanish Armada was a close-run thing, and it was only broken up by a somewhat magical storm that didn't allow the Armada to land and pick up soldiers in Holland and completely destroyed it as they crossed around Scotland and left all these Spanish sailors adrift on the beaches of Scotland and Ireland and so forth. So if you think about what the spies in Prague were doing, they were trying to counterbalance this rising force, force of really quite nasty Catholicism from Philip II. The Inquisition, Philip II, in addition to loving to grab paintings and store them away in his private quarters, uh, was quite a fan of the auto de fe, uh, the mass burning of heretics and so forth. Rudolf II spent his early adulthood, teenage years at the court of Philip II. And unlike his brother Matthias, who thought this was a really good idea, Rudolf came back to Prague absolutely aghast at what the supposed Christian church had been doing. And Rudolf's goal was to completely circumvent the Catholic church, to actually create a new hermetic Rome in Prague. Since Rome has seven hills, Prague has seven hills, the idea was that we were going to restart the whole idea of spirituality, politics, etc., on an entirely new basis. Now, it's not really Rudolph's fault that it didn't succeed. Uh, I don't think anyone in the late 16th century could have pulled it off, but good old Rudolph gave it an excellent try. Now, most of the angelic workings that Dee and Kelly did, most of the transmissions of this language and this information happened in and around Prague. And as I said, the, the Enochian language is a completely new language, but it's a real language. It has its own internal structure, grammar, syntax, and it's translatable. And it's actually a language that you can take a step forward and create new invocations. You can actually write things in Enochian. So it's a, a real language. Several things happened in Dee and Kelly's experience. Kelly being a hothead, uh, one of Rudolph II's couriers mentioned the fact that he had the top of his ears cut off for forgery and that he had a very ra bad reputation. And again, Kelly being very hot-headed, he challenged the man to a duel and killed him against the direct prohibition of Rudolf II, who had forbade dueling. So this sort of broke the bubble of good feeling, so to speak. And Dee went back to England. And eventually, the emperor forgave Kelly, gave him his own house right below the castle in Prague, and um, set up his alchemical laboratory. Kelly produced many more transmutations in front of almost anybody who wanted to come watch. But unfortunately, Kelly wouldn't tell Rudolph the secret. Kelly, again, being a rather disputatious and ornery fellow, believed that no one human being, particularly the ruler of a large empire, should have that much power. 
So Rudolph got very upset, and he put Kelly in prison. And again, Kelly, being very impetuous and adventurous, tried to escape. He fell. His rope wasn't long enough. He had a rope to come down the side of the castle, and it ended about 20 feet above the ground, so Kelly jumped, and he shattered his right leg, and they had to cut it off. And so the emperor forgave Kelly and put him back to work and said, okay, now we've had this misunderstanding, but you're going to continue making gold for me, right? And Kelly said, okay, that's good. That's wonderful. And a couple of years went by, and then Rudolph started in on, are you going to tell me the secret? And Kelly said, uh-uh, no way. So Rudolph put him in prison again. And again, Kelly was having none of it. So on his one leg, he, he was hobbling through the uh, castle toilet to escape out the poop chute and slipped on the excrement and broke his other leg, which was also cut off. So Kelly was in pretty bad shape, and he, he, he still wouldn't give Rudolph the secret. So Rudolph locked him up in uh, the equivalent of a maximum security prison, the prison in a little town called Most, which is the Czech word for bridge. And um, while he was in prison, he sent to his family for some medicine, for the tincture, et cetera, that, that would cure his infirmities. And his family, because the emperor had been leaning on them very heavily, instead of sending him the tincture, sent him poison. And as Kelly lay dying, he cursed the city of Most and said that it would be completely wiped off the face of the earth. In the early 19th century, Most, which was a coal mining town, had a coal slag avalanche, and the entire town of Most is now under about 20 feet of coal slag. It no longer exists. So the, the moral to that story is don't piss off Eddie Kelly. The gist of it is, is that Kelly never revealed to the emperor the secret. Being in the English-speaking world, we all focus on D, because we know about D and his connection to Queen Elizabeth, and, and even in the last few years, there's been more evidence of his connection with the theaters, designing the sacred geometry of the theater, and then the globe. So we're, we're, we're much more familiar with D, but on the continent, among continental alchemists, Kelly's the hero. And Kelly's works were the basis of what would become the Rosicrucian idea of alchemy. And right on through Fulcanelli, a famous French alchemist, it's Kelly's ideas that everybody goes, oh, that's wonderful. Okay? So in the English-speaking world, Kelly is this crazy guy who had his ears cut off and may or may not have been a con man. And in the rest of Europe, he's the one true alchemical genius of the Renaissance. Interesting how that happens, isn't it? But he didn't tell Rudolf II the secret. He told a few other people the secret. Oswald Kroll, Michael Meyer, Michael Sendegovius. And they were able, from Kelly's work, to continue doing documented transmutations. So what was the secret? What was the secret that, that Fast Eddie Kelly was willing to die for? Well, I'm going to tell you. Most of the meteorites that hit Earth, 90%, are iron-nickel based. But there's about 10% of these meteorites that are silica based. In other words, they're glass. And the silica based meteorites have inclusions of heavier metal so that the heat and pressure of entering the atmosphere infuse the silica with fused or fusion-based heavy metals, iridium, rhodium, platinum, palladium, the PMG group of metals. Now, the more platinum and palladium and iridium you have in a meteorite, the more the color of the glass becomes dark red-purple. So 
starting all the way back at Egypt, if we just simply look for meteoric glass, then suddenly the whole secret of alchemy becomes very clear. We find in the Old Kingdom, the original early dynasties of Egypt, that there was an enormous amount of gold that seems to have no source. Unless you want to speculate that the Egyptians were sailing to North America and far distant sources, places for sources of gold, then we have to say they made it because there is no rich gold ores immediately in the Nile Valley. And there's no way to account for the amount of gold that the Old Kingdom used and had unless you want to speculate they got it from the Americas or that they made it. Now, one of the interesting things is that up until the 19th century, every apothecary shop in Europe had mummy dust. And mummy dust was sort of part of the universal panacea. You would eat mummy dust, drink mummy dust, and it would have a, a salutary effect on, on your immune system. It was a cure for lots of things. Now, in that mummy dust was gold dust and a very strange form of gold, a monatomic gold that had sort of popped like a popcorn kernel. Now, no one really understood why that was or where it came from until you start looking for the origins of mummification. In the Old Kingdom, started using a certain type of natron or salt that could only be found in one place in the western desert. And guess what? That's one spot where they found all the salt for mummification in the early dynasties was also the location of a yellow silica meteorite. In fact, some of the Egyptian glass, some of the Egyptian faience was actually made using this yellow meteoric glass. But as part of that meteor, there were other trace minerals. And at the center of the huge expanse where the yellow glass meteorite landed are the natron beds. So using the natron, the salt from this meteoric glass, to mummify, and then over time, the very subtle energies coming from the priests who were doing the rituals and coming from the energy of the bodies that were being mummified, it transmuted the heavier elements in the mummy in the body into monatomic gold, mummy dust. Now, very early on in the Old Kingdom, the sacred scientist of Egypt discovered the basic principle of how to use this meteoric glass to transform other metals into gold. Now, this idea remained, but the secret slowly over time was lost until you get to the founding of alchemy in the first century AD in Alexandria. They still had the principles, but they had forgotten what the prima materia was. In other words, the idea that this was connected to heavy metal infused meteoric glass had completely disappeared. So other than a few transmutation that we find in the first and second century, there's a gap in which we don't find any documented, any really hard evidence for transmutation for roughly eight or 900 years. Then something very curious happened. If you remember your Bible, when Abram switched from being Abram, worshiping the God Most High, which was Draco, to worshiping Yahweh and becoming Abraham, an event happened. Abraham sacrificed unto, unto Yahweh, and through the middle of his sacrifices passed a flaming torch. And the tradition is that flaming torch is the meteoritic stone that's encapsulated in the Kaaba in Mecca. Now, in the early 10th century, a group of followers of the family of the prophet called the Fatimids, after Muhammad's daughter, Fatima, came to power, power all across North Africa and in Egypt. And the Fatimids had a little splinter group called the Ishmalis. They're still around. And they were pretty radical folks. So in the early 10th century, the Ishmalis destroyed the current version of the Kaaba and removed the stone. And 
they gave part of that stone to the Fatimid caliph in Cairo. And about 60 years later, the stone was put back into the Kaaba when it was rebuilt. Now, the only problem is the volume of that stone had shrunk by 60% between when the Ismailis put it out and when it was officially put back. And in the later rebuildings of the Kaaba, you can clearly see that earlier it used to be huge, and now it's really small. So what happened to the missing 60% of this extremely rich in platinum, palladium, iridium, rhodium meteorite? What happened to it? Well, apparently, the, Chi the Caliph of Cairo, the Fatimid Caliph, kept most of it, and he passed it on to his son and his grandson. And his grandson, El Harun the Mad, the Mad Caliph, about 100 years before the Crusades, uh, apparently got a little bit too fond of it and didn't understand how to work it, and it drove him crazy. And the tradition is he buried his most secret treasures under the temple, Herod, the remains of Herod's temple in Jerusalem, and walked east into the desert and disappeared. Now, one of the things El Harun the Mad did was he declared the entire city of Jerusalem was off limits to Christians. Then a few years after his time, the Turks swept out of Central Asia, conquered the whole region, drove the Fatimids back, and they also continued the idea that Christians could visit the city, but they couldn't visit the holy places. And slowly over time, this became the cause of the Crusades. So the first crusade, wading through blood up to the horses' fetlocks, conquered Jerusalem. And the first thing the new king of Jerusalem did was install a group of very strange knights in the ruins of Herod's temple, supposedly to protect travelers, although there were only a dozen of them, so how could they possibly protect travelers? And what they really seemed to have been doing was carrying on archaeological excavations under the temple. Twenty years down the line, they made a discovery. And they took that discovery back to Europe, and they collected the greatest Kabbalistic scholars of that age to analyze the find. And within 30 years, we're off and running again with authentic, validated, seen in front of everybody, transmutations. So the source of these new transmutations would seem to be the information and the material found under the temple. And as we begin to track this, we begin to see that they had the prima materia, and there may even be a little bit of it left, buried under Notre Dame Cathedral. That's another story. But they didn't know how to make it. They didn't know how to get any more. They knew how to use the meteoric glass they had to produce the powder projection and the, the philosopher's stone and therefore turn lower metals into gold, but they didn't know how to make it. They didn't know how to make the powder projection. So over time, it was lost. Now, the Templars really screwed up around the year 1300. They performed a transmutation in front of the King of France and the Pope. And they gave the crucible to the Pope's assayer, his treasurer. And the Pope's treasurer validated it as this is 100% genuine. This gold is purer than anything we could make. This is purer gold than anything we've ever seen. Now that sort of preyed on the mind of the king of France as he sunk deeper and deeper into poverty and owed more and more money to the Templars. How come these guys that are working for their own agenda have all this power, all this gold, and I don't? How come I have to borrow it from them? Mm. So eventually, the Pope and the king of France came up with the idea that we'll just declare the Templars illegal and we'll take the secret from them. Well, like Fast Eddie Kelly, uh, the Templars said, uh-uh. And the Pope and the King of France didn't get the secret. And due to the Black Death and other things, the secret was lost until 1388, when a marvelous fellow named Nicholas Flamabel discovered part of the documents, a copy of what they found under the temple, Flamel, yes, discovered a, a copy of the documents that showed how to do it, 
And he also discovered a piece of the stone. And so we have another wave of documented, authenticated transmutations starting in 1388. And as that little piece of stone began to run out, the transmutations dropped off. So that by the time of Dee and Kelly, there were very few documented transmutations. Now, Kelly thought he had some of the powder of projection when he arrived in Prague, and he very quickly discovered he didn't. Now, one of the great regrets that I have of this whole thing is that Dee's magical diary for the year 1585, in which all of the alchemical research was conducted, is missing. Whether Dee didn't keep it, he kept it in another place, and it's therefore lost, or whether some lucky person may turn it up among the debris in the British Library, we don't know. It may still be there, may not. But during 1585, Kelly and Dee discovered that what they had thought was the powder of projection was worthless. But they stumbled onto the fact that Prague itself was a large macrocosmic version of an alchemist crucible, and that the as Michael Meyer showed in one of his drawings, that the prima materia in Prague is in the water, in the trees, in the air, in the river, in the road. It's everywhere. This is what all that's left of the megalithic Prague Stonehenge that Labusa was standing at when she declared, when she declared that she saw the golden city of Prague. Now, curiously enough, about 120 million years ago, a silica meteorite, roughly 70 kilometers across, smacked into Prague, smacked into central Bohemia. And it created a cup within a cup. It created the seven hills of Prague, which are the inner crucible, and then it created the mountains that surround the edge of Bohemia, that's the outer edge of the crucible. And it vaporized with such a tremendous explosion that all this meteoric dust became infused into everything. And at the center of the crater where the meteorite hit, it melted the rock, it melted the granite, and condensed it. These, the granite in these megaliths here are of such a fine quality that I have seen nothing like it except on the inside of the king's chamber. Okay? And in these rocks, as you can see, there's a gold streak. Golden glow. This is quartz. This is quartzite. But it's quartzite that is, this is not the sun. The sun is shining in a different direction. This is literally golden quartz. So somewhere along the line in 1585, Dee and Kelly discovered that the prima materia was literally everywhere in Prague. And perhaps they even went and chipped a, a piece off of these stones to restart their powder of projection. Now, curiously enough, for 200 years before this time, there was this legend in Prague of the Jewish Kabbalist creating a protector for the Jewish people called the golem. And the golem was made from river mud and river sand, which is full of this meteoric glass, and through a process very similar to the energetic magical process that you do for the transmutation, the river mud sand monster was brought to life. And at the time that Dee and Kelly were in Prague, the last of the great golems was created by Rabbi Lowe. Now, Rabbi Lowe was a very famous Kabbalist, and he was also a good friend of Dean Kelly's. And he was also one of the few Jews ever to be honored by a head of a European state. He was also a good buddy of Rudolf II. So the magical spiritual technology was in place from making the golems, you simply had to apply that to the right prima materia, and you produced a powder of projection. And then from there, it was a very simple matter. You could run down to the basement and whip it up to show visitors. 
to turn lead into gold. And again, Kelly and Rabbi Lowe neglected to tell the emperor exactly how easy it was, neglected to tell the emperor that, you know, it was everywhere. All you had to do is just go scoop up some river sand and go to work and you could do it. But the fact that we have a golem and that we know from various writings that the magical Kabbalistic process to make a golem, which is that to hold the charge you put the word Amet, same as the seal of truth, on his forehead, and that brings him to life, that animates him. And then when you want him to go to sleep, you erase the A, and Amet becomes Met, which is death, and the golem goes to sleep. Now, the story is they forgot to erase the A one night, and the golem went on a wild party like a tourist on a spree in Prague and uh, got very destructive, and that's the origin of the Frankenstein stories. And uh, they had to physically stop the golem, hold him down, and erase the A to get him to go to sleep. But as the uh, guide will tell you at the old Jewish synagogue and cemetery in Prague, the golem's remains are still in the roof of the synagogue up under the beam where he will still be until the next time the Jews of Prague need protecting. So when you overlap all this, it's very easy to see how Prague is sort of the jump-off point for this whole new pattern of, of alchemical transmutations. So after the, over the next 150 years, we have a, a large pattern of transmutations, and we can trace the successful alchemist directly back to those people who either studied Kelly's work or, originally, talked to Kelly directly while he was held in prison. Now, Kelly had no problem with telling people like Oswell Kroll, Michael Meyer, Michael Sindigovius, the secret, because they were part of the Brotherhood. Now, that Brotherhood would become the Rosicrucians. And the reason for that ties back to our Shakespeare story. Rudolph II was obsessed with a painting by Albrecht Dürer called The Festival of the Rose Garlands, in which Mary is crowned as Queen of Heaven, and she is distributing rose garlands to Maximilian II, Rudolph's father. And then the Christ child in her lap is giving a rose garland to the Pope. And the significance of this image is that the Holy Roman emperors were crowned by Mary, higher authority, and the popes were just crowned by Jesus. Okay? So they were establishing their primacy in a spiritual sense over the church. Now, the Rose Garland painting, which arrived in 1588 in Prague, and it was a big deal. It had been carried upright by teams of runners over the Alps, and it was a huge procession through the streets of Prague and up to the capital. And Rudolph had it hung at the very entranceway to his private apartments where he would see visitors. So anyone in 1588, 1586, 1587, who went up to the castle to talk to Rudolph had to pass directly under this huge painting of the Festival of the Rose Garlands. So the students, spies, associates of D, D began to call them the Garland Brothers, or Brothers of the Garland. And as we know, the Rosicrucian documents all contain D's hieroglyphic monad, so there's a link between the Brothers of the Garland, Dee's time in Prague, and what in a few years' time would become the Rosicrucians. And the origin point is that picture, the Festival of the Rose Garlands. So Kelly could tell the secret to people who were already in the Brotherhood, already had the high sign, because he could trust them, because they understood the mystical import of the subject. You couldn't trust an emperor who was looking out for his own political interest, but one of your magical brothers who had taken similar oaths to you, you could trust. Okay? Now, perhaps we should talk a little bit about the angelic workings themselves. Dee's great intellectual discovery, which happened in the 1560s, was discovering the idea of the fourth dimension. Now, this was a radical idea. He called it the 
holy grail of mathematics. Now, they didn't have any mathematical way to describe higher dimensions, so it had to be described rather poetically. But in one of the documents that we have that is attributed to D, we find a series of seals that, when put together properly, form a cube within a cube. And as you can see, okay, as you can see, that's the basis of a tesseract or a hypercube. Now, this idea was sort of bubbling around in the back of Dee's mind since the 1560s. And even though he didn't have the mathematics to describe it, he realized very early on that this was the secret to higher orders of information, higher orders of learning and awareness and science. Dee was a very smart man. If you could imagine what it would take brain power wise to even imagine that there's another physical dimension that we can't see, can't understand, and that it contains a right angle to every other right angle in the world, you get an idea of how smart D really was. Okay? So to have discovered the idea of a hypercube in a very ancient magical document just sort of blew D's mind. It just opened, kicked the doors wide open to all sorts of very entertaining things. So when he began the angelic workings, one of the things he was continually looking for in the angel transmissions was this sort of higher dimensionality, this sort of higher mathematics. Now, the early language works in the seal of truth, yes, this has very powerful symmetries, it has very powerful mathematics, but it wasn't until the angels really kicked in in Prague that the good stuff started to come. And the very idea of the elemental seals, the elemental tablets, form a hypercube. Um, in other words, he, he, the angels transmitted four tablets, one for each of the elements, and they are arranged in such a way that if you go off the corner of one, you come back in the opposite corner. If you go off the corner of another one, you come back in the opposite corner. So you're moving from hyperdimensional space to hyperdimensional space. There you go. So this was a very, very powerful idea. And the basic idea was that if you're working with four dimension and higher energies, that you have available to you this very powerful but very subtle force that can literally change the shape and the atomic number and the nature of physical elements. So as the angels began to deliver this, this very amazing piece of science, D, even though he couldn't mathematically understand it, understood the value of the information. And as the system grew, as the angels became more intense and more complex, the whole working climaxed in something called the Tablet of Nalvage. Dan? That's fine. That's, that's all we need to show. Can we go back to Tablet of Nalvage? Right there. Now, the Tablet of Nalvage is one of the last of the Enochian tablets or seals to be delivered. And the angels specifically told them that this one contained the secret of alchemy. And, of course, D uh, didn't understand it mathematically. Kelly didn't understand it mathematically, but being the sort of person Kelly was, he just said, okay, let's, let's give it a go. Let's see what's going to happen. And this was the basis of the science of alchemy. Now, with our more modern perspective, we can actually understand 24-cell, 4-D figure is the very first one. we can actually chart the Tablet of Novage and make a very complex four-dimensional structure called the 24-cell. Now, in 3D, we have five platonic solids. In 4D, we have six. There are analogs of the five in 3D, and then there this figure, which is completely unique. 
There's nothing like it in 3D. There's nothing like it in 5, 6D, further on up. This is a 4D uniqueness. And what makes this unique is if you look at the central cube here, it's a little hard to see because it's tilted. The whole figure turns inside out through the center of that cube without distorting. In other words, it's the same on the inside as it is on the outside, and it can rotate through itself and maintain self-similarity and compression. So this is where all higher energy pressure waves nest. All of the five 3D solids can be nested in it. All of the 12 regular Archimedean solids can be nested in it. It can generate all the lower 4D. It can generate all the higher 4D. It can also generate every image, which there's only three in 5 and 6D, can generate all of those. This is literally the geometric origin of the Philosopher's Stone, as the angels told Dee and Kelly. Now, this by itself is pretty astounding that uh, the angelic intelligence would be able to deliver something that would take 400 years for mathematics to catch up with. Which sort of brings me around to the message. If you were a vastly intelligent, vastly powerful spiritual being or race of beings, such as the Ophanim or the Whirling Ones, and you notice these little quick short-lived monkeys were trying to evolve, you, you wouldn't squeeze something physical into a tin can and throw it right below the speed of light across the galaxy. That's terribly inefficient. You would simply deliver to them something that would be really important. Now let's imagine that you're on Gilligan's Island. Anybody remember the old TV show Gilligan's Island? Okay. How many times did the professor make a coconut radio? Okay. So what the angels did is they sent the instructions, first of all, a language so we could communicate, and then they sent the instructions on how to build an astral internet, an astral radio, an astral communication set. So if you were a higher intelligence and you wanted to help out these little quick monkeys down here, the first thing you would do is teach them how to communicate with you. So you could give them more instructions. You, you wouldn't arrive and, and offer them a potato pancake and, and blow their minds, or you wouldn't take them and give them anal probes and check their DNA. That would violate free will. Free will is a constant in the universe. But you would send to the most brilliant mind on the planet. Anyone seen the old Day the Earth Stood Still? Michael Rene? Well, remember, Michael Rene wanted to go see the equivalent of Einstein. That's right. And that's exactly what the angels did. They looked for the brightest monkey mind on the planet, and they said, here, figure this out. So Dee was able to receive all this. Kelly, being a, a very sharp, practical guy, was able to use some of the science without understanding it. And now, 400 years later, we have the actual math to go, whoa. Okay. Now, if we think about all the other ET, UFO encounters, the proof is lacking. It's, we don't have any hard science. We, we don't have really a piece of, a, of an alien ship. You know, maybe in Area 51, who knows. But this is proof. When this was received in the 16th century, no one understood it, and no one could understand it. The math did not exist. And the fact that in the last 70 years or so, We've developed the math that allows us to understand this. It's solid proof that Dee and Kelly were actually talking to a higher order of intelligence and a vastly higher order of intelligence, an order of intelligence that comes from different dimensions or at least works through higher dimensions. Okay. Um, if you go to the, uh, uh, the penta pentagram with the nesting, it's further down, further down. There it is, right there. That one? That one, no, one below it. Okay. All right. 
Now, have you ever wondered why all the witches and all the magicians use pentagrams? What's the importance of a pentagram is, right? In 4D, the analog of a tetrahedron is called a pentatope. And a pentatope is a tetrahedron with another tetrahedron stuck on each of its four faces. So there are five pentatopes, five tetrahedrons in a pentatope. Now, if you took a pentatope and tilted it properly so that you could shine a light through it from 4D down to 3D, the resulting figure would be a pentagon pentagram. And the order in which we draw our pentagram pentagon, according to the law of attraction and repulsion, is actually the stacking order of the angles of the tetrahedron. So that when we draw an invoking pentagram, we're bringing energy from 4D into 3D. And when we draw a banishing pentagram, we're sending the energy of 3D back into 4D. In other words, unmanifest, manifest, manifest, unmanifest. And as you can see from this diagram, each of the shaded regions, they're shaded to give you the idea of, of how the tetrahedron is stacking. But if you stack them properly, this is what you form, form. Okay, there's the pentatope. So when you're drawing a pentagram in the air or using it as a sigil, you're ordering energy from higher, more subtle four-dimensional energy down into 3D and then taking whatever energy you like from 3D and bumping it back up to 4D. Now again, this is a traditional method of doing very complex science that we only begin to understand now. And one of the basis, the basis of, of this science could not be clearly understood until we had a formulation of a mathematical fourth dimension. But every witch worth her salt knows how to use the pentagram, okay? Go back to the order, Dan. Yes. He, he wants that one. Well, these shaded pieces, this is banishing, this is invoking. So the order in which you stack and draw these lines that outline the edge, that forms the invoking or banishing pattern of the pentagram, moving it from 3D up to 4D. Okay, how are we doing on time? About 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, I, I don't, don't want to really get that, th that deep into it. Um, let's go on with the ETs. Okay. Click, click on that one. Uh, yeah, the, that project tree, the one right above it, right there. Now, how do higher order intelligences in the galaxy know where we are? It's because the Earth has a zip code. And that zip code is based on your good old Kabbalistic tree of life. If you take a tree of life, we lost it. Okay. That's interesting. Yes, there you go. If you take the tree of life and you project it outward onto a sphere roughly one light year in any direction from the sun, you get in one direction something like this. Now imagine that we're filling this in in all four directions so that the central pillar of the tree is unique and the side pillars overlap and we have 26 circles. Okay, and if you can go to the other one. Uh, no, it's, it's further up. Yes, that one, that one. Yeah, it's hard to see without my glasses. There you go. Now, this is the northern hemisphere, this is the southern hemisphere, and if we just simply from Earth diagram this pattern, there are stars in each of these circles. 
Now this circle right here is at the ecliptic, north pole of the ecliptic, and it appears from our telescope-based ideas that there is no star there. However, in the last 20 years, we've discovered, deep space astronomy, that there is a star right in the center. And that's in the coils of Draco, in the very still point in the center of Draco. And it's a very long way away. And the science fiction-inspired scientist who came up with it as a joke, sort of, I'm at my most serious when I'm joking, the angel says, named it Arrakis, or Dune. Funny people. So these, where the six are, those are the bright stars that are attributed to the Carib Carib Carubic beings. They're Regulus, Vega, etc. Those are the bright stars that are right on the ecliptic, right on the equator of the zodiac. And then there are stars in each of these other locations. Okay? And if you simply want to find Earth, then you find where all those stars come together. So Earth's zip code, in a galactic sense, is this projected tree of life. In other words, if you're traveling intergalactic spaces, and you're not flying in a tin can at sub-relativistic speeds, but you're actually teleporting, traveling fast, traveling in consciousness, then you better know where you're going because it's hard to stop, <laughs> right? So in, in your little personal teleportation spaceship, you plug in your zip code and hit the go button and boom, you're one light year off of the sun. Now Dan is showing also the animation of how the solids, three-dimensional solids create the tree of life. Yes. And you, you had to do what you're seeing here in your head. Embedded. Yes, you, ha you had to be able to visualize it. Okay. But you'll notice that the top part of the tree, which corresponds roughly to the northern hemisphere, is a dodeca. Yeah. So the reason why our planet is so hemispheric, north, south, east, west, you know, one has more water, one has more land, etc., is because of this kind of growth quality, okay? And it, it's a very special little cocoon we live on in a very special little place. And because we have all of these subtle geometries that we now read as ley lines, and because once upon a time we were smart enough to intuitively understand all this, and perhaps once upon a time, if you wouldn't stood in the right spot, you had access to the control panel of Spaceship Earth, and you could just simply pop over to the next star system, okay? You can make one of these with current astronomy software for any planet in our local, say, 70 light year little group. Uh, I have a program called Redshift that will show you the stars from any of the local star systems. And you can therefore determine the zip code for any of those stars in our little local star system. No, no, that's fine. So, to, to sort of wrap it up, angels are not cute little funny things that the New Agers go, oh, isn't that sweet? Can we, can we flip to the eye in the tornado? Yeah. They actually look like this. This is a self-sustaining plasma storm the size of a nebula reaching one little tendril down to talk to us. If all the fuzzy warm people who go, oh, I want my own little angel, could actually see an angel, they would run screaming from the space, okay? Angels are huge, self-organizing plasma creatures that are enormous. They're the size of nebula and they're eternal. If you get your plasma organized into this kind of tornado, you never die. So the whole goal of what uh, the O'Phantom and the angelic beings were doing is they were giving us a language, first of all, to communicate with them, 
so that they could teach us how to steer the tornado. Okay, click to the explosion. Yeah, this one. Now, 2012, whether or not we're actually on the trough or the, or the front of the super wave, it's going to be something like this. An enormous amount of energy and plasma coming out of the center of the galaxy, and it's not going to have a good effect on us unless we've actually been able to learn to talk to these large, organized, angelic beings who will then give us instructions about how we take care of or transmute these frail little meat sacks we live in into something that can actually survive the tornado. Now, with that in mind, Dan and I are proposing a Calling All Angels project between now and 2012. At the moment, at the moment, there are less than a dozen people on the planet who have any understanding at all of the Enochian magic of Dr. D. And I really wouldn't trust but about half of those dozen. That's sad. We waited 400 years to get the math to understand it. Now we understand it. We can chart it in detail. I can talk for another three days about the details of angel technology. But if no one does the work, if nobody plugs in the internet, if nobody turns on the radio and tunes in, it's all been worthless. We're going to fry. We're going to become dinosaurs and we're all marching off to the La Brea Tar Pit. But if we can create a situation in which a sufficient critical mass of people have an understanding of this language and an understanding of what it means and the ability to communicate directly with those angelic tornadoes with eyes in them, then maybe we have a chance. And it seems to me that since D himself was pretty well obsessed with the coming apocalypse and they knew pretty well exactly it was coming now, they could date it. Any good astrologer, astronomer in the 16th century who knew what to look for could dial it in within about 20 to 36 years. So they knew it was coming, they knew when it was coming, and the angels were literally giving us instructions so that right before it hits, we'll have enough science, enough information to plug it in and get instructions on how to build a lifeboat. In other words, once you get your coconut radio going, uh, the next instructions is, okay, how do we build a boat and get off this island? Okay? So that's what the angels are trying to tell us. It's not enough to turn lead into gold. That's fun. That demonstrates the principle. We have to turn time, the time, into gold. And that was the goal of the Rosicrucians. That's the goal of everybody for the last 420 years. Let's change the time from the age of iron in the Kali Yuga to the age of gold. And what that literally means is that we have to become just as self-similar, as fractal, fractal, the same turning inside out as gold itself. And we have to do it as a community, as a planet. It, it's, we're screwed if six people who are somewhat crazy are the only ones who know how to do this. It's got to be a lot of people. Uh, enough to recreate the human race and enough to evolve. The shift we're going through is the exact same shift that happened 26,000 years ago when Cro-Magnon evolved from the Neanderthal. And in a few generations, your kids will look back on us and go, oh, those Neanderthals, oh, those cavemen, I can't believe all those little electronic toys they played with. Didn't they understand you could just do it with your mind? Okay? So before we all get stuck in the La Brea tar pit, we have to do our bit to evolve the next level. Oh, a bee, excellent. Bees understand higher dimensional geometry directly. Exactly. So that's the lesson. It's in nature. Only nature overcomes nature. There is nothing that's supernatural. There's just nature we haven't experienced yet. So the goal of all this is over the next 18 months or so, we'd like to have 
a lot of people learn the basic language and learn the basic geometry so that when the time is right, we can actually talk to the angels and learn how to build a lifeboat. Without the lifeboat or without a really good surfboard, we're doomed. And that was a happy ever after. Yes, that's a happy ever after.